right? Fundraising Academy at National University, the exclusive sponsor for our Friday, Friday, Ask and Answer Fri episode of the nonprofit show uh, every Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time and 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. So I lean into your nonprofit community. So Lashana, I'm going to go ahead and roll along here with our, our show. Uh, my name is Tony Bell. I'm honored to be one of the co-hosts uh, for the nonprofit show. Uh, we have a cadre of professionals in the nonprofit space uh, that co-host the nonprofit show every day. Uh, and they include Julia Patrick from the American Nonprofit Academy, Mitch Stein from Chariot, Miko Marquette Whitlock from Mindful Techie, Wendy F. Adams, Wendy's also a CFRE from Cultivate for Good. Then there's me from Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy, Sherry Quam Taylor from Quam Taylor. And last but not least, Meredith Tyrion a, uh, from the Fundraising Academy. So a lot of really exciting folks uh, sharing their experiences and guiding conversations with awesome folks like you, Lashanda. Happy to be here with you today. Thanks. And then also we want to thank our sponsors for the nonprofit show. Uh, I always say that these folks are very special to me uh, because they realize the importance of professional development within the nonprofit space. So uh, our sponsors include Bloomerang, the American Nonprofit Academy, the nonprofit show, nonprofit thought leaders, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, the nonprofit accounting specialist, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So woohoo and thank you to all of the sponsors of the nonprofit show. We're so grateful that you uh, provide this opportunity for folks to enhance their skills and really be better raising money for the causes and communities that they support. So much gratitude to our sponsors. And let's see here, it's our first question. So here we go, Lashonda. I'm gonna read you this first question uh, from Name Withheld in Colorado Springs. And this question is, at our last board meeting, we were all asked to fill out a questionnaire that asked some very personal questions. They included our faith construct, sexuality, ethnicity, and political affiliation. This information is going to be used to determine what board diversity is. Does this seem right to you? What do you Gosh. think? Does this seem right to you? Name withheld. Very Name interesting withheld. question as we are diving in on this fry yay. So I will start with, if it doesn't seem right to you, then perhaps there's a challenge. Um, I can understand the value and appreciate the importance of having diversity within your board. However, how is your board truly defining diversity? And are these particular areas of diversity essential to your mission of the organization? And how does it align? How is it essential? Similar to developing a prospect profile, you'll only record essential information that you are comfortable with the particular prospective donor reading about. And if you're not comfortable sharing this information, this is your opportunity to share how you feel and have a conversation about how are we truly defining diversity? Because again, there's value, but how essential is this particular, these particular areas of diversity important to your roles and the organization? And, and that's so smart. And, and I agree with you so much on this. And, and like anything that we do, when we implement something new or we make a change within our organization, one of the first things we need to talk about is the why. So, exactly. you know, so really, really explain to board members why have we, you know, passed out this questionnaire and why is this information critical, mission critical? Let's start there, right? Why, how is it mission, mission critical? critical. And, and in my consulting work, I've done these types of surveys with boards, uh, but it's really focused more around skill sets and industries uh, because we want to make sure that our board is representative of all of the industries within the communities that we're serving. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we, we are diverse in terms of ethnicity and gender and age. And a lot of that we can do without a questionnaire. 
I completely agree. And then also looking at, you know, I've done surveys holistically as well, but, you know, there are other facets, you know, the rationale with having the diversity with the various skill sets and industries is also an opportunity to help your organization amplify your fundraising by having additional networks in various industries and key influencers in places and spaces. And those individuals have arrived at those particular positions and you selected them to be on the board because they have deemed to have an alignment with your organization is what I'm hoping. And again, when you're thinking about those essential elements that make us all unique and different, those are conversations that would probably be best had before we decide how we're defining diversity. And again, giving them the opportunity to share what their concerns are, what diversity means to them. And so I definitely echo the sentiments in what you share. Yeah, well, thank you for that, Lashana. And I would say to name withheld, does this seem right to you? It doesn't seem wrong but it looks like there needs to be some tweaking of the process, right? So it doesn't seem wrong in that I understand the motivation for wanting some data, uh, but but perhaps this deep dive into this type of data isn't necessary, uh, you know, for uh, for the organization. Isn't mission critical for the organization? Right. I can't think of any like I can't think of any grant that goes that far in terms of asking about demographics. Right. No, exactly. I mean, they will ask often what percentage of your board financially contributes to the organization. Exactly. Yes, right. But I don't know that I've seen uh, this level of uh, of questioning on any type of uh, of grant application. I'm really glad that you brought up the grants because that came to mind also. So good stuff. You ready to move on to the next one? On to the next name withheld. We hope we helped. <laughs> yes, thank you, Name with Hell from Colorado Springs. Okay, let's see now. This question comes from Anne Marie, and Anne Marie is in Omaha, Nebraska. And let's see, her question is I have taken over a few donors from a retiring development officer. The think is that there are a few of these people who I don't think are a good fit for me. How should I navigate this? I don't want to appear picky, but I think there is a better alignment with some other people on our development team. Have you had that type of experience, LaShonda, where you're handed a portfolio and you go through and you think, eh, this might be better suited on someone else's desk? <laughs> I have been an observer firsthand of that particular scenario. So I am wondering, is that someone I may possibly know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a small fundraising world. It's a you never small know. fundraising world. And I'm thinking Anne Marie could possibly be a pseudonym, but needless to say, uh -huh. um, what I will say, I'll begin with the essential. And that is relationships is the heart of fundraising. And as we're thinking about the core of fundraising, we understand that when we're identifying individuals within our portfolio, obviously there's some kind of synchronization and rationale. But a part of that too is who is the best person that can facilitate that relationship and manifest it into an opportunity for the organization. Um, with this being a new list or new portfolio, um, it's easy sometimes to say it's not a good fit. What I would recommend is perhaps those individuals that you think may be a better match, asking them to join you on a visit so that you two can cultivate the relationship as a, as a, as a pair and identify if it's a better fit for that particular individual and see how that prospective donor or current donor engages with that person that you perceive to be a better fit. So that when you do have an opportunity to talk with your prospect research team and or your manager, you can share that you've had a conversation, you know, the two of you visited with the donor and both of you agree that it may be a better fit for them. Rather than just arbitrarily making an assumption, we want to make sure that we're doing things with the intent of advancing our causes, but also what works very well for the donor. That is awesome. And, and I'm, I'm so glad that you brought up, you know, the opportunity for collaboration and going in as a team, right, to really get an understanding and, and to get that sense, uh, not just your own sense, but a sense from someone else and whether or not they feel right. like a good fit. Uh, let me ask you this, Lashana, because it just came to mind. Uh, I know within the Fundraising Academy cost selling curriculum, there is the Madden test which allows yes. you to help qualify, uh, you know, potential donors and investors for your organization. Is there such a thing that exists or should there be such a thing 
for us as fundraising professionals that helps us, if, if we're looking at a portfolio, is there a Madden test that we take that helps identify the right donors that should be sitting within our portfolio? That is an excellent question. And I definitely would say that there could be an adaptation to the Madden test. And thinking about you as a professional and your role within the organization, uh, many of our organizations may have multiple initiatives. However, there may be some initiatives in which you are far more passionate about, and you may discover when you are speaking with donors that the conversation seems to be a little more fluid. Um, it, it's, it's very um, effortless to engage with them on particular areas of interest. Mm -hmm. um, and then just like you know mentioned before in the previous uh, question, when you're thinking about who is the best fundraiser to manage the relationship, who is the person that's most passionate about that particular area the individual is interested in funding? So for example, another instance may be um, having the conversation with the prospective donor, and you may not necessarily be the program expert, but bringing that program as expert with you and or once they've identified an area of interest that you're not that familiar with and that person demonstrates that they want someone that has a vast knowledge of that and one of your colleagues happens to have it that's also a development uh, professional, then that's another opportunity to say, you know, Tony, I am very excited that you're really interested in this program area. I would love to invite Pearl to join us in the conversation. Do you mind if I invite Pearl to the conversation? Because she has a little more in-depth knowledge about the area in which that you want to fund. And that's the method of transitioning that relationship as well. And I love how you're asking permission, right? It's, it's part yes. of the no surprises rule. You don't want to just show up with someone. <laughs> exactly. You, no surprises. And, you know, that helps build the trust with the donor because one, you're asking for permission. And then second, you're also inviting them and letting them know that this may not be your area of expertise, but I want to bring in the expert to ensure that you have a great experience with our organization and that you're able to make the type of impact that you're looking for. So this is, this is uh, definitely could be a win-win for everyone involved. Well, I think that you gave Anne Marie from Omaha, Nebraska, some great recommendations there and, and some stuff for her to think about. So Anne Marie, I hope that that helps you uh, because certainly uh, this question screams that Anne Marie is, con is not concerned, but wants to make sure that they're doing the right thing when it comes to relationships and, and the donors. So I, I thought it was really a really thoughtful. And Anne-Marie, we don't want you to appear picky either. Uh, so exactly. hopefully, hopefully that uh, that uh, great information from LaShonda will help guide you in terms of your, your next steps. Uh, let's see here. We're going to move right along to the next one. Oh, here we go. There's a dollar sign in this one, LaShonda. How often and at what level should development officers bring their CEOs with them? Our CEO is super busy and I think we should set a cap amount whereby she is invited to all asks where the amount is at least $25,000. Have you even heard of this before? This is from Darren in Buffalo, New York. What would you say to Darren? Darren, um, this is a very good question that's relevant to each and every one of us. And I will start with, unfortunately, answering the question with the question. So at first, I would say it looked to look at how your organization defines major gift or principal gift. It's very essential that we are mindful of our CEO or our CFO's time and how we use the time because resources are very important for all organizations. Mm -hmm. So if your organization defines a major gift or personal or principal level gift at $25,000, when you're looking at the gift and what it encompasses, you want to take an assessment. Um, is it a blended gift? Is, does the donor have even higher capacity? Mm -hmm. um, and I would definitely take a look at what your typical major gift amount is or what that average major gift amount is because you don't want to have to inundate your CEO with countless requests at the $25,000 level, whereas you may um, not receive as frequent um, proposals or submit as frequent proposals that are at the like $100,000 level. But again, it depends on your organization. So you want to look at how you're defining your major gifts and you want to be very selective with, with the uh, CEO's time. Um, so depending on the size of the organization, so I've worked a lot in higher education and higher education when it comes to our president, um, she would 
entertain guests that are at the corporate level. And so those higher level gifts, which would be considered principal gifts or perhaps major gifts, depending on the organization. So those that are like, you know, 500,000 to a million plus. But again, it depends on your organization size and what your typical large gift size is. Um, there's also been instances where I've worked at smaller um, nonprofits in which our executive director would meet with individuals um, that were at the $50,000 level and join our development officers. So it depends. You want to make sure that your CEO is considered on reserve um, for the standpoint of you want to make sure that they're the individual that you're bringing in for those significantly larger gifts um, just because of the time that it may require. Um, and, you know, this is an opportunity, you know, maybe perhaps the CEO comes in at the lunch when you're closing out or finalizing whatever the proposal is, or perhaps another option is having some type of um, an open house or a small salon event where you have a group of prospective donors that you've been cultivating as at a particular level. And that way your CEO has a chance to interface with that smaller group all at once, you know, mm -hmm. about 10 individuals. So they do feel like they've had that exclusive access, but it also limits, you know, how much time you're requiring of your CEO to ensure that they're able to continue to, to work their pipeline and, and continue to merge and have sponsorship and partnerships within the community and the business sector. Oh, for sure. I love those salon events. And then, you know, I just something else for Darren to consider, uh, you know, CEO, as you're saying, Lashana, CEOs and presidents are often super busy. Uh, so think about whether or not there's a board member or the board chair, the board president uh, that can attend. I've had very successful uh, kind of closing the deal, if you will, uh, yes. you know, with, with a board member and the president of the board. I've also gone into, uh, you know, major gift or principal gift meetings with someone that has benefited from our, you know, from the services of the organization. So there are ways to bring others in that help kind of um, underline the importance of the mission. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the CEO all the time. You're absolutely right. The, you know, the president of the board or someone on the board. And mm -hmm. again, you just you want to be mindful and thinking about what um, particular area or program that individual is funding, because another option that we mentioned earlier with Anne Marie, it could be the person that's over the particular area of program right. in which they want to impact. So it doesn't always have to be the CEO. There are a variety of um, individuals, I'm certain, within your organization that you'll have access to that can help um, amplify the importance of their gift and also provide that supplemental support that you need to close the deal. Excellent. Good stuff, Lashonda. Thank you. And hopefully Darren gets a lot out of that. So, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we look forward to, uh, to hearing back from Darren and letting us know. I can't wait to hear. I can't wait to hear. Oh, this is a good one. This is from Roger in San Mateo, California. And Roger's wondering, we're looking at next year's budget and trying to determine if AFP ICON annual conference is a good investment. Would you please give us your honest opinion? Also, is it important to send the entire team or just one or two people? Roger, that is a very good question. So I must start with a disclaimer because I want to be very forthcoming. I am an AFP icon fan. I have been to AFP icon five years, I want to say, mm -hmm. and I find extreme value in AFP icon one because of the countless number of sessions. Um, I think this past year when it was in, in Toronto, there were at least 180 sessions Two, super robust. Super robust. There are a variety of different tracks. So for every aspect of fundraising, there is something for everyone. Whether you are a practitioner and you are wanting to gain additional knowledge and expertise in the area in which you're working in, or if you're aspiring to elevate and work in a different area, you have that opportunity to learn from that. But in addition to that, it can be a little overwhelming. And I can remember going for the very first time. And with all of those options and so little time, 
I did feel a bit overwhelmed. However, the bright side was that the um, AFP offers an app so that all of the presentations are available through the app in case if you may miss one or something may be happening course at the same time. So what I would recommend in terms of the number of people, if your budget allows, I would recommend at least two people so that you can kind of go divide and conquer for a lack of better words. Um, and then also thinking about your organization, you know, because AFP Icon is truly an investment in, you know, professional development, can your organization afford it? And if not, please think about your local chapter. There are scholarship opportunities available depending on which particular criteria you fall up under. There are scholarship opportunities for first timers, there are diversity yep. scholarships, local area chapters offer scholarships and financial support. So there are a variety of different ways to supplement um, the cost to ensure that it's affordable for your organizations. And then I would definitely say that it's worth the investment. And an alternative would be Cultivate that we talked about before. Fundraising Academy offers conferences and there are other conferences as well that may not necessarily cost as much. They may be more cost effective, but equally as engaging, equally as impactful. Um, with Cultivate 2025, we mentioned earlier, we had a dynamic time. We had 18 sessions. It was definitely cost effective. And, you know, information about that is available on the Fundraising Academy's portal. You can sign up to learn more, just like you sign up for AFP to find out more about the various conferences that are happening. Um, another option to ICON may be like a lead or local area conference. So there yeah. are a variety of different um, resources available for professional development. Well, you hit on all the things that I would have said as well, LaShonda, about, you know, taking a look at what's happening like right in your own backyard. If AFP icon is, is not obtainable with, you know, with the current or, or future budget. Uh, but what I will say to Roger and, and to his organization is congratulations and kudos for having this conversation and for wanting to invest in professional development for your team. Uh, and what you also said, LaShonda, uh, if possible, send two people because whether it's AFP, ICON, or yes. even Cultivate, there's just such a wealth of information and so many great people to meet and relationships that can be developed uh, through these conferences. So if you can send two people, definitely do that. Um, but I just, again, you know, Roger, congratulations. Uh, let's celebrate that you all want to invest in professional development. AFP ICON will not disappoint. At all. Within your budget. <laughs> if you can't afford it, then please dive in locally uh, with your local chapter and take a look at all of the great things that I'm sure that they have on their calendar to help build your, uh, your success. And one other thing that just came to mind, Tony, as you were talking, is if your budget is limited and you have only one person going, or even with two, depending on the size of your team, you also want to take a look at the schedule in advance and have a strategy. You must have a strategy when you go to maximize the time to ensure that the information that is essential, not only for yourself as a professional, but for members of your team that are not able to attend, that you're able to at least attend up so the sessions so that when you share those presentations back with the team that you're able to provide a, a little bit of substantive information from the presenter's perspective. So also have a strategy when you go to conferences. It's so important. It this, you know, it reminds me too, conferences very similar to when you join your local chamber of commerce. I mean, in, you know, in, in most communities, if you're a member of the chamber of commerce, well, there's a networking event every night and there's this and there's that, you know, within one week, there could be 14 different opportunities to engage in your chamber of commerce. So very similarly, right, you have to have a strategy because uh, you, you can't necessarily be in all the places all the time. Um, and not. Uh, right? I'd love to clone me, but I can't. <laughs> and then, you know, if you're if you're a rock star like LaShonda and you go to 14 things during the week, then you have to have the bandwidth and the capability to follow up and respond to all of those activities, you know, all of those 14 yes. things. Uh, so you uh, you have to keep that in mind, too, that, you know, you go to conferences, there will be follow up because you're going to want to follow up with presenters and other folks that you met. Uh, so you don't want to overwhelm yourself with your follow-up also. <laughs> so uh, so again, congratulations, Roger and, and LaShonda. Good stuff. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, that was our last question. We went through Gosh, that. that was uh, quick. I know it was pretty quick. 
And uh, we've got just, you know, a, a few more minutes left in, in the show, LaShonda. Uh, when you reflect back on, on some of these questions, so whether it be kind of the board questionnaire or taking your CEO with you for an ask at a certain level or investing in conferences, do you have any final thoughts on any of those topics for our, for our viewers and, and our listeners? What I will say is that there was some continuity with each of those questions and the important continuity or piece is relationships. And when we're thinking about our respective roles within our nonprofit organizations, and we are trying to work hard to fulfill the mission of our organization, keep in mind in all that we do, the importance of the relationships and the impact that we're trying to make. And being very thoughtful and intentional about uh, the way that we develop our strategies and everything that we do, whether it is creating your cultivation and engagement plan with a donor, whether it's your engagement with with your board and or whether it's preparing for professional development, we want to be very strategic so that we can maximize the time, the resources that we have to benefit our organizations. And we want to be able to amplify impact. And we can do that by being strategic in everything that we do. So true. And, and what I also hear you saying, LaShonda, is the importance for us to lead with intention. And that's so yes. much of what we do needs to have intention, you know, behind it. Um, so thank you for sharing that. So it's been so much fun connecting this Friday for Ask and Answer with you, LaShonda Williams, MPA, CFRE, trainer at the Fundraising Academy. And, uh, and LaShonda, remind everyone what you do full time. <laughs> So full time, I'm in the space of Memorial Hermann Foundation, and I work with our leadership level giving, and it has been fantastic. I just started a couple of weeks ago, so I am diving in with all things healthcare as I've transitioned from higher education for many years. So I'm very excited on this new journey and new chapter. Awesome. Well, wishing you much success in your new role, Lashonda, and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you in a future ask and answer, if not during another nonprofit show uh, topic. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your great wisdom with us. It's, it's just such a joy to see you and uh, and hear from you. The pleasure is all mine. It's, it's always great to talk to you. And I love sharing and hearing from the viewers, some of the questions that they have. And it it's an affirmation that sometimes, you know, how you may think about something that you're not alone and do know in this space, you're not alone. Never alone in this space, that's for sure. And again, we want to take an opportunity to thank our presenting sponsors who bring the nonprofit show to our audiences every single day of the week. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, the Nonprofit Show non Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, the Nonprofit Accounting Specialist, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So once again, uh, thank you, LaShonda. Uh, thank you to the Nonprofit Show and the American Nonprofit Academy for bringing such a great resource uh, to the nonprofit community. And much thanks to all the fundraisers and everyone out there that's supporting nonprofits. We appreciate you so much and thank you for all that you do. And as we always say at the Nonprofit Show, Please be well so that you can do well.